Hey, hello everybody. This is Doc T, and I'm broadcasting live again from Jensen Beach. And today we're going to be talking about beyond the 10 irrefutable laws of horsemanship. But what I like to do is to double check with everybody, make sure everybody can hear me. So if somebody would just say, yes, I hear you, that would be great. Nobody's saying anything. Ah, hi, Nancy. Thank you for saying that. Okay. This is um, going to be divided a little bit differently. I'm going to have a shameless advertisement at the beginning of here for you to guys to become members of the Horses Advocate. And then I'm going to get into what I'm talking about and get to the halfway point. Then I'm going to give everyone intermission. And the reason why I want to give it intermission is that this is going to be a fact-filled, intense training episode where you're going to stay on your toes and you're going to be taking a lot of notes. So hopefully a lot of you have uh, paper and some pens or paper, pencils and you can start taking some of these notes because what I'm going to talk about today I've never really talked about before. This is brand new stuff based on my 10 year of laws of horsemanship and I'm going to go over exactly what's going on. But first, if you haven't become a member of the Horses Advocate, I want you to. Just go to thehorsesadvocate.com. It's free, but you do have to sign up and become a member. That's my way of assuring you that you understand I am not your veterinarian. I'm not here to diagnose any disease in your horse. That's for your veterinarian to do, and you have to maintain that relationship that you have with your vet. Okay, uh, also if you sign up, you're going to get a free copy of the 10 Irrefutable Laws of Horsemanship in a PDF format that's downloaded straight into your computer. And this way you can read it and follow it and uh, learn it. Um, the Horses Advocate has a ton of stuff, like all these Horse Talk webcasts are there. All of my Horse Sense sessions, that takes a short topic, maybe five minutes or less, and it goes over one uh, specific idea. Another is uh, Ask Doc T, where I'm going to find questions that are commonly asked, and I'm going to answer them very quickly and succinctly via um, a video, which is going to be really cool to watch. You can just hit play and, and I can talk to you. It's going to make it really easy. And every published article I've ever done or any recorded interview is going to be there or will be there. And it all has one goal in mind. Through knowledge, you can become your horse's advocate. And that's something I think everybody listening to this wants to become. Okay, why is it free? Basically, learning about horses from a trusted source that has no agenda is the only way to overcome, overcome the huge manure pile of information that exists today. I don't know why I said manure pile, but I thought you guys could relate to it because it really is. There's so many people out there trying to grab your attention and say, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. I've got the answers, and nobody has all the answers. But I've got some that seem to be working for me over the decades, and I just want to leave them out here on the table before I go. So this is what it's all about. Um, this is me. This is a self-portrait I took. Uh, I don't know why I like this picture, but I do. Uh, I'm Doc T, also known as Jeff Tucker DVM, and I'm your host tonight. So uh, everybody uh, just sit tight and relax, and we're going to uh, fly through what I call the learning center of the equine practice or what's officially known as the horsesadvocate.com. Okay, I've got a slight cough, and I don't know how to cover my mic, so I'm just going to do the best I can. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Good. Is everybody here? Okay. Uh, I teach horse owners to become an advocate for the horse living in a human world. I simplify concepts and, and ideas into the basic fundamentals because I believe knowledge is power. Now, I've been doing this for a long, long time. I've been with horses since 1973, so you don't have – you guys can do the math. I think that's like 43 years now, um, and I've been a veterinarian since 1984, and uh, I work on tens of thousands of horses all over the United States, and they're all strangers to me. They're all like – New, not all of them. Obviously, once I meet them the second time and third time, they're not, but I meet new horses all the time. And each time I have to walk in, I don't have 30 days, I don't have 30 minutes, I have about 30 seconds to connect with a strange horse and introduce a steel file into their mouths and start floating their teeth. <clears throat> and I think that this is a really cool thing that I've learned, and especially now that I've got the dentistry school going. Um, I've had to take people who, have, who want to learn my technique of horsemanship dentistry, and Melissa and I together work hard and try to, con to convey to people just exactly what horsemanship is. And that's what this uh, seminar is all about. So I'm going to try and get through this interview or this introductory part 
a little bit quickly, but I can't until I uh, rec uh, introduce to you my team. Here's my wife, Kathy, and my son, Matt. And we are your trusted source of information because we have so much experience with horses. Well, uh, some people could say maybe we aren't that trustworthy. We're kind of a little bit, oh, I don't know, crazy. But we like to have fun, and I want you to also realize that this is all about fun. So seriously, we are a team that's trying to bring to you together right now all the information that we've got that will make your life with horses easier. So I want to talk about horsemanship, and um, maybe I should say here, I think I say it here, or I say it in a little bit, this is a continuation of a horse talk that I did last January. That was all about the 10 irrefutable laws of horsemanship, so I'm going to just touch on them. I'm not going to explain them much. You should watch that webinar, read the book, and learn all about horsemanship dentistry from that one. Pardon me, horsemanship, the 10 irrefutable laws of horsemanship. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I love my coaching that I get across here. It's like, uh, uh, I don't know, I can't live without these guys. They really help me. Um, we're going to be putting all this stuff on YouTube. Our YouTube channel is going to explode. I mean, we've got almost 15,000 people on Facebook now, and we're going to easily match that number on YouTube. We want to get this message out here. And the mo more of you who actually go to YouTube and like these things on YouTube, uh, the better off everybody in the world is going to be because it's just a huge platform. So you should try YouTube. Our YouTube account name is Equine Practice, I believe, just without the word the, just Equine Practice, two words all together. Matt's going to check on that, and he's probably going to type it right here on the uh, posting thing just to make sure you know it. Anyway, this is the continuation of the Horse Talk from January 2016. That is on my website, uh, thehorsesadvocate.com forward slash horse talk and you should be able to um, review that there. But this is called Beyond the Ten Irrefutable Laws of Horsemanship. It's probably going to be the premise for a new book that I'm going to put out. But anyway, you can get a free PDF copy from Joining the Horses Advocate, or you can get a paperback copy from my website, theequinepractice.com forward slash books. You can get it uh, as a hard copy in your back pocket with this nice cover of me on the front, or you can get um, a downloaded uh, 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 iBooks version on iTunes for your iPhone. All right, so <clears throat> why has horsemanship become so complicated? And this is a question I asked in my um, in my uh, last seminar on horsemanship. And in my opinion, horsemanship, um, all the new methods just complicate what we as humans already know in dealing with other people. They complicate it because they try to make the communication process uh, more of a mechanical event. And while there is certain mechanics involved in communication, um, it still basically boils down to gut feelings and energy. And as we all text and phone these days, it makes our communication very, very efficient. I can talk with people on the other side of the planet via Skype and talk as if they're in the same room. But it doesn't make our communication more effective. So communication is a lot more than just words. Communication is energy, and I leave this words on a black screen because it's so important to understand. Communication is energy. So not that I want to bore you with this energy frou-frou stuff, but it's just one of those facts. And I do want to ask you this. Is your communication skills with your parents, your spouse, your auto mechanic, the person behind the counter, 7-Eleven, and all the other people, how good is your communication skills with those people? Are you able to be effective with that? Can you maintain relationships through thick and thin through your communication skills, or is it lousy? Because if you're not good with communication skills with people, you're not going to be that good with humans. So I'll bet, unless you're a dictator or a mob, your kind of communication skills with other people isn't working well. The best most of you do is offer treats as a reward or an enticement for a behavior. Let me show you an example. Does this look familiar? I think this is the most abusive thing you can do to a horse, and I know I sit way outside the comfort zone of most people, but I never feed treats to a horse. I think that that is rewarding bad behavior at most times, and I'll get into that, and I'll tell you why it is. Okay, <clears throat> from what I can tell you, almost every horse training involved, uh, uh, the, the, the clinics that are out there that teach horsemanship involve you doing something to the horse. For instance, they put a, an obstacle or some sort of device out in the 
arena for the horse to, to work with, or you put a special halter on, or special lead, or special rope, or special whip, um, and uh, some people really advocate the use of round penning a horse. And all these things are you doing something to the horse. And the big difference is that what we do every day is only changing ourselves. And this is huge. If you can understand this one concept, this one difference between what I call horsemanship and all the other types and styles of horsemanship out there, not all of them, because there have been several people out there who talk about uh, changing yourself to become a better horseman. And they've been around for decades, if not longer. But I'm talking about right now some of the big names out there are asking you to change the horse. And I guarantee you, you can't change your husband or your wife. You can't change your your children, you can't change the guy behind the 7-Eleven counter. You cannot change them. The only person on this plane that you can change is yourself. And that's what I want you to do. If you want to become a great horseman, first look in the mirror to find all the problems you're having with your horses. Next, read every book on leadership that you possibly can find. And then change yourself and leave your horse alone. I guarantee you this will work. I've got proof. Because again, I cannot go to every horse that I see from here to the uh, great state of Washington, the, the great northern state of Vermont, and all the states in between, and walk into Strange Horses' stall, and 93 uh, times in every 100 horses that I see, I'm able to walk in and work with a horse without having to give any sort of drugs and get to work within 30 seconds and effectively file every tooth in that horse's mouth. That's what horsemanship dentistry is, and that's what I want to teach you guys. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to break this uh, webinar down into three steps. One is I'm going to review all the laws written in the book, and step two, I'm going to ask questions, or I want you to ask questions as I get into the depth. So uh, keep your eye on the chat uh, line and see people asking questions, and my son is going to alert me to some questions that are there, and I'm going to pause and try and answer all the questions. Uh, I can see them too, but you know we're all just watching, and, and sometimes I get involved and I miss something. But anyway, we're going to try and grab your questions, and at the end of each law, I'm going to address some of your questions about that law and see if I can draw it out. And then, of course, step three is practice, practice, practice. Uh, remember, you're only changing you, <clears throat> and because you're only changing you, if this doesn't work, only you is the reason why it doesn't. And that's tough love, guys, but that's the only reason why horsemanship isn't going to work for you, is if you're not doing what you need to do. All right, the two parts of the uh, 10 irrefutable laws are divided into one through four of the physical laws and the five through 10 of the mental laws, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. Uh, law number one, a horse can seriously hurt you and even kill you. Sorry to bring this up. Uh, I know it's just one of those things you don't want to hear about, but you always hear that happening to other people from uh, minor injuries to death. And these animals can uh, either accidentally or on purpose hurt or kill you, and you have to remember that. But more importantly, law number two, the horse that will hurt or kill you is your own, and that's because we let our guard down. <clears throat> and here this young lady has her arms around a horse, in the back of the stall with no halter on and anything could happen and this horse would suddenly jump and accidentally take the heel off this poor girl's uh, foot and um, she'll be hobbling around for a very long time. <clears throat> Always use a halter, lead rope when working with a horse. I've gone over this and the reasons why in the last um, webinar on horsemanship, so I'm just going to pass over it, but always, I can't tell you how many times somebody says, Doc, can you take a look at this thing on my horse, and they walk in, and then they start pointing at the horse, and I stand outside the stall saying, not until you put a halt and lead rope on, and they roll their eyes, and they say, sure, okay, fine, but I can tell you, I can guarantee you with certainty, if you don't have the horse's head, the horse can wheel on a dime and put you in a, a compromised position, so never, ever trust a horse or know what they're thinking. And of course, uh, law four is always place yourself between the exit and the horse. And this is including a stall or a paddock. Never, ever, ever go to the back of the stall or a paddock and uh, just allow the horse to run past you. It's just not going to work. Again, I go over these four laws, and so that's all I'm going to say about it this time. Law five. I'm going to take a deep breath. <sighs> what about these trainers <clears throat> that do at liberty work? Is that okay or not a good idea? I've got to be honest with you. I have not studied any other person's um, real horsemanship skills. I know liberty is allowing a horse to be at liberty where you have no physical connection with the horse. I believe that's what it is. Yeah. 
Um, this is what I want to talk about is how you make a connection. I'm not here on how to train a horse or how to make it think differently. I just want to lay this out and then maybe, Abby, you can tell me if this is like Liberty Horse Training or not. I know my wife spent a long time, like several months, reviewing all the different um, um, clinicians that are out there. And she took away from that that there's a blend of a lot of things out there. But most of them are still working on the horse and asking it to do something, to move their feet, to lick their lips, to lower their head, to do all these things. And yes, they're all signs. But what I'm going to say tonight is you can work on yourself and you're going to see all these things happening without even doing anything to the horse. It's that cool. Okay, let's get into law number five. And I'm going to um, blast through this and then I'm going to take a break um, and everybody can go, you know, go to the bathroom or do something. And, um, um, but here we go. Okay, in horsemanship dentistry, you only have 30 seconds. I've already said that. Okay, let's just skip over that. Leadership is setting the vision of where you are going and empowering those around you to join in this vision. Leadership is a willingness to become intimate with those you are leading and become willing to do everything you are asking the others to do. Now this is really important because if you're lazy, don't expect your horse to be a workhorse. You need to be as, as um, invested in what you want done with a horse as you want the horse to become invested. Every leader out there wants to lead a company or a, a country or a church or something. They want to lead, but they have to have complete investment and belief in what they're doing. They have to have a clear vision of where they're going, and they have to empower people. They can't take whips. They can't take prods. They can't beat people into doing stuff. They have to create such a desire that for people to join them. And the secret of becoming a leader is empowering those around you to do at least what you're doing, if not more. So know that every horse on the planet needs a leader in their social structure. That's a given. I think everybody can agree with that. There's always a herd hierarchy out there with the alpha mare, the number one person, or the number one horse. But every human in a domestic relationship with a horse is, in the mind of the horse, included in the pool of available leaders. So in other words, um, when they say who's going to be the leader, they're looking at you. Are you going to be a leader or not? And if you're not, uh, that's not good. Um, when you become a horse owner, you subscribe to this relationship. And not recognizing this principle of horse behavior leads to conflict and leadership every single time. So I want to go over something called the six basic human needs of, of people. Now, I don't know if you believe in Tony Robbins or follow him or anything, but this is something that he's been advocating in humans for a long time. And because I, I listen to that and I look at horses every day, I mean, I don't know, tons of horses, thousands of horses a year, I start to see the similarities as well as the differences. And I'm finding that these six basic needs are also in horses. And that's why I want to go over them because this gives you some sort of basis for why you need to become a leader. And this is why it's so important. They are certainty. The next is uncertainty, and that means variety. The third is significance. Everybody wants to feel significant. Fourth is a connection. We all need some sort of connection with, with the other people around us. Five is growth. And then six, of course, is contribution. Now, these words are just words right now. I'm going to take each one at a time and use it in the sense of what you're going to be doing with a horse. All right, certainty. This comes with confidence and clarity of what you want done. It requires you to listen to your story. You need to dump the things that have happened in your past. The past does not equal the future. If you base your leadership on fear or past experiences, you will bring certainty of failure to your relationship and history will be repeated. So if you're scared of your horse hurting you or you said, geez, you're, my horse over there never does this or always does that, you know, and that's your story, then that story is going to be repeated. You have to go in there with certainty, and that certainty is infectious. When you become certain, your horse is going to become certain. And I don't mean tongue-in-cheek, oh, I'm certain the horse is going to be a jerk today. No, it means that I feel certain about who I am and my relationship with this horse and where I want it to be, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to move that horse in that direction by setting the example. That's what certainty is all about. Most people fail to become leaders because of this one block. 
Be more certain than any person or horse around you, and you will become not only unstoppable, but people and horses will just want to follow you. That's what people do. When people are certain about who they are, where they're going, whether it's a movie star, a rock star, or someone who knows who they know who they, who they are, people flock to them. They love certainty, and horses love it too, but you can't fake it. You need to have certainty come from your heart, and this does become easier with experience. If you go out to your barn tonight or tomorrow morning and walk in there saying, I'm going to be certain that this is going to work, but deep in your heart you don't, that's when you say, okay, this is going to be a process, this is going to take time, and I need to work at this. And just write down a million times on a piece of paper, my horse and I are going to have the best relationship possible, and, and say why, describe it, know it. You know, if somebody corners you at a cocktail party and say, so, uh, George, what do you think your uh, purpose with your horse is? Bang, you've got it. You know exactly what it is. That's certainty, and that's what you need to bring in the stall. Every time Melissa and I walk into a stall to work on a horse, we are absolutely certain that we're going to come in there, we're going to make a connection, we're going to relieve the horse of its pain, we're going to leave that horse uh, at the end of our, our uh, uh, work with him, with a horse knowing with certainty that the horse is going to feel better than when we started. And we just know that. Now, on the flip side, one of the um, uh, basic needs is uncertainty or variety. And being different is enough for most horses to listen to you. In other words, if you go in and, and the same thing is there happening every day, the horse is going to expect the same result. So if you bring in some variety or uncertainty, you're going to have the horse's attention. So, for instance, when I walk in, I'm a stranger, I'm a man, I'm a vet, and for many reasons, the horse is immediately going to just turn to me and say, whoa, who are you, stranger danger. But for you, it's your responsibility to change things up and not follow too much the same routine. A great start to this is to, become, is to come into the stall expecting a better result. That, you know, that's going to be so different than, than, than the horse is going to suddenly say, whoa. Who is this person just in a stall? It's not the same person. That's the uncertainty that every horse and every person wants to see. It adds variety. It adds interest to life. So that's the difference between certainty and uncertainty. Significance. This is so important. I find that so many people thirst for significance and never get it. And this is the number one reason why so many people tear other people down because they tear them down to make themselves feel more significant in the person's eyes that they're talking to. And it's, it's evil and it's uh, cancerous in your mind. So significance is building people up um, with, with a strong and empowering, uh, uh, just empowering words and, and, and uh, actions. So the problem is most people dilute it. Uh, so what I mean by that is every horse and person likes praise, but for meaningful things such as completing a task, especially a difficult task, like you show up on work when there's a blizzard outside and you say, I'm here to do my job and you're on time, that, that should require praise. But if you show up on a sunny day, just like a regular routine day and you showed up for work, you should get praise. It's expected. That's what you should do. Unfortunately, most ho horse owners upon arrival at the stall bring candy and offer it to the horse. Why? Does this look familiar in your barn? Is that bucket of candies available, ready for reach to give to the horse just for its being alive? That's not good reward, and that's not going to create significance in this horse's life. Significance means you ask a horse to do something like, for instance, move over to the side of the stall, and he says no, and you become patient, and you work with confidence, with clarity, and you say, I'm going to see you on the other side of the stall, and that's my goal today. And you go in with that confidence, that certainty that that's going to happen. Already the horse has your, you know, you have the horse's attention because you brought in uncertainty of, whoa, who is this person? Why hasn't she given me a candy yet? And then you use some techniques to get the horse to move over. As soon as it does, bang, that's when you give the reward, and it shouldn't be candy. It should be a pat on the neck, good job, because you always have those in your pocket. All praise should be simple and not food-based. You're not training with food reward conditioning. You're rewarding through actions which are always more powerful than words of food. I've learned this over and over and over again, that if you say the same words, they just alluded, people don't even hear them anymore. But if you withhold uh, words and you give actions that are meaningful, that's important. 
Uh, when something's done correctly, praise it and move on. Uh, when somebody, or pardon me, when something is not done when asked or is done incorrectly, any insignificant action is called nagging, and nobody likes it. I'll give you a great example, and I can't tell you how many times I ask people to stop doing this when I'm working on a horse. But when the horse starts to back up or say, you know, what I call squirming in the dentist chair, or is giving some sort of behavior that's not wanted, almost every horse owner I know breaks into um, this little series of expressions such as, it's okay, it's all right, don't worry, it's all right, it's okay, I'm just going to be doing this, it's all right, just stand still, it'll be fine. That's called nagging. Yes, there's silence here. Because almost every horse owner I know is guilty of it. And what you need to do is recognize that what you're doing is you're rewarding that bad behavior. If a horse is backing up or doing something that he shouldn't be doing, then just stand still, lower your energy, and have certainty of what you want. And the horse will stop, he'll listen, and he will come to you if your energy is right. And I'll get into energy in law number nine. But he's not going to be hearing the same story over and over and over again. For instance, how on earth can you tell a horse it's going to be okay when I'm shoving a metal rasp down its mouth? I mean, on what planet does this even make sense? So of course they're scared, of course they're worried. I'm a stranger, I've got something in its mouth, I'm scraping its teeth, and they're gonna say, whoa, what the heck is this? And to lie to them to say it's okay is, how about if I turn around and put that float blade in your mouth and you tell me it's gonna be okay? It's not. We haven't earned that respect, that trust between the horse and myself that I should expect good behavior from the horse. I'm actually expecting resistance, I'm expecting bad behavior. Because that's part of the process of us communicating. And through that, the horse can learn that, oh, it's not. But once the horse learns that it's not bad, then the horse has learned it. He hasn't listened to you say, hey, it's going to be okay. It's just Doc throwing a foot down your, hand, your, your, your throat. He now knows it. And now the lesson's learned, and now it's not a problem. That's the difference. So please, stop nagging your horse and rewarding bad behavior. That's one of the basic tenets of becoming a great leader. Um, I guess I've just gone over this. Uh, remember, it's the energy you use, not the words you say or the food you give. It's always your energy that leads. You have to learn how to control your energy because energy always flows to the lowest uh, spot. So if your energy escalates, they will raise their energy to match yours. And this is the most difficult concept to understand, but once you master your energy, the horse will always come to you, and that's the secret. Okay, connection. Isn't this what we all want in a relationship? Isn't the loss of connection that we break, the reason why we break off relationships? Isn't it the abrupt loss of a connection when a loved one is suddenly gone that makes us cry? It's not the physical, it's a relationship, it's a mental connection. So what drives us to the barn in every weather condition, at any hour, on every family holiday, on 4th of July, you guys are going to be in your barn mucking the stalls. Why? It's because of the connection you have between you and your horse. It's the connection that drives you out there every day. It's the connection that we live with horses and do what we do. Now, i got to be honest. I don't understand why the new veterinarians and equine dentists automatically drug horses, uh, every horse that they work on, because they're not going to get any connection that way. It, you know, They're dull, they're blurred, or any, any relationship is absolutely eliminated by the drug, good or bad, uh, pain or no pain. It, it's just eliminated, and so the connection is made super easy because, frankly, there is no connection. So if it's the love, uh, the connection that we love about our horses and other animals, um, we, that's what we need to work on. And what's really cool is if you can work on this connection with all the animals around you, it will also work on the humans around us as well, even strangers. It's just amazing what happens. Uh, growth. <clears throat> this is, what, the sixth part? Um, or maybe seventh, uh, 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 fifth, pardon me, of the um, six essential um, needs of, of humans and what I feel is of horses too. Now, this is all about a purpose in life. While there are degrees of growth, it is not the destination but the process of growing that inspires you and your horse to continue living. So if you wake up in the morning and say, I'm not growing, I have nothing to live for, you're basically dying and there is no reason to live. Growth always involves 
expansion. Uh, it involves construction, whereas the opposite of that is destruction or demolition. And, and as you destruct, uh, you fall apart and eventually die. So we need growth. And while growth requires food for all of us, in horsemanship, the food is not, you know, oats and, and hay. The food is bringing certainty, bringing variety, significance, and building a connection between you and your horse. That's the growth. So now the horse sees you coming in. And he says, wow, I know that this person's coming in with certainty, so I trust him. He's a leader. He or she is a leader. I'm getting variety because I know that there's going to be something new today that I'm going to be learning. I, I look forward to this variety. And I don't mean variety in the simple ways. It, it's, it's more of an esoteric thing. The variety is just knowing that today is going to be special. You're going to bring significance into the ho horse's stall. And every living being on the planet needs significance. Without significance, they feel like they're not growing. Trust me, significance is important. As simple as just putting your hand on the shoulder of your loved one and saying, wow, you're special to me today, and mean it. That's giving that person significance, and that will last the whole day long. And then through that, you're going to build a connection between you and your horse. And now the connection is a two-way street. It's not just you going out to the barn, the barn, but the horse saying, whoa, my owner's here. This is fantastic. I've got my connection. I'm living for this connection. Both of you grow. Just seeing a loved one, just being there makes you feel stronger. And that's what you can have with your horse when this happens. And I'll tell you, Melissa and I often go into horses that we've done over two, three, four times. And when we do, they know who we are. They step forward in the stall right up to us instead of hiding the back corner. They know exactly with certainty why we're there and what we're going to be doing. We're removing the pain inside the horse's mouth. And they absolutely love us and respect us. And the owner sit there and say, you have no idea. This horse won't stand for anybody. And the horse just stands there, actually loves what you're doing. That's the connection that we make with horses. And that's what you can do with almost every horse that you get to. So every horse you feed these required needs to. Feel the growth of your connection with the horse. If this doesn't juice you to work with horses, you need to find something else to do with your life. Because same with human relationships. This is why we do what we do. Finally, contribution. Now, this is really an interesting part because contribution is the culmination, I believe, of all the things that are in your life, and it gives you an abundance. All right, so basically, you're going to give back in time and energy at least what you have invested to make the lives around you better than, the, than before they met you. Leadership is about empowering those around you to do more than they think they can do. It requires that you contribute to their lives by simply doing the best you can be and giving your abundance to those around you, your abundance of certainty, your abundance of uncertainty, your abundance of significance, your abundance in your ability to communicate with a horse, your abundance in growth. Once you have these things and you give them freely, you're contributing to a relationship. And once you contribute to a relationship, it is almost supernatural that that contribution will be given back to you. Now, charities accept money as a representation of your abundance, but horses don't accept money. They, they use up all your money, but they don't accept money. They accept your generosity and you giving them the basic needs beyond the food they seek. I, trust me, once your horse knows that you're in there to give them their basic needs that they have, certainty, variety, um, significance, uh, growth, uh, connection, then you're going to have that contribution that feeds uh, both of you, and you're going to have a great relationship in the barn. So to become a leader, contribute your certainty, your variety, your significance, and your connection to, to have the horse grow a connection with you. Through this, the horse will contribute back to you the same. And through this process, a willing partnership is made. It is the only way to work with horses, but it isn't the easiest. The remaining laws will make it easier, but remember, you are working on becoming the best leader you can be, and that's all there is. You learn this one law, law number five, become the leader, and you are miles ahead in your ability to work with almost any horse you come across with. All right, so that's the end of um, number five. You have to get up and do a little break or run to the kitchen and grab something to drink or whatever you have to do. I understand that. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to take a quick sip of something to drink to wet my whistle. And... Uh, when you get a chance, go over to theequinepractice.com forward slash books 
and there you can buy the ten irrefutable laws of horsemanship in a paperback from the publisher. Um, I get a few bucks from that. It's not really that much. It's mostly shipping, handling, and all the other stuff that goes with that. Uh, they get most of the money. You can get an ebook from the publisher for five ninety nine, and for five ninety nine you can go to iTunes and get it as an iBook. So you always have it on your iPhone at any time, so you can uh, go through this. Also, the size of the book is made so it fits in your back pocket. It's relatively thin, uh, small dimensions because I wanted people to shove it in their back pocket and take it to the barn and use it as much as possible. Uh, some people have actually bought a bunch of these books. Uh, to give to their students or to give their uh, class or students the um, uh, summer camps. They just hand them out and say, look guys, let's read this book and this is how you work with horses. And I'm really honored and touched by that. So um, it's really, to me, it's everything that I do every day with horses. Now, if you want to get it for free, all you have to do is become a member of the Horses Advocate by going to thehorsesadvocate.com and click on Become a Member tab, which is right there at the top. And you're going to see simple discussions of topics on horse care, and the membership is free, and you'll also get a free PDF of the book, The Ten Irrefutable Laws of Horsemanship, which you can read on your computer or you can send to your printer and print up on uh, eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper, staple them together, roll them up, stick them in your back pocket, and take it with you. Um, the goal, I think, for everybody is to try to um, memorize these things. So if you ever come up to me and you say, hey, let's talk about Law 7, and you're like, Huh? No, you know what Law 7 is, and, and you can just start talking about it. Um, what else can I tell you about this? There's something else. Hmm. Oh, the Horse Advocate. We, there's over 6,000 photographs. Uh, I'm redoing the photographs. I'm going to repost them in the next couple of weeks. Um, they're a little bit clearer and crisper. Uh, I found a new development process. They're going to be more uniform in size. Uh, I'm going to restructure the order of things uh, and make it easier for you to find them. I'm also going to add uh, all the articles. I found 258 blogs that I've written, and some of them are on really specific subjects. I write articles for a holistic horse and other magazines that I'm going to be posting on there so you have access to it under the correct subject. I cover everything from uh, barn construction, um, for instance, water uh, systems or hay feeding systems. I cover uh, medicine, including eyes and skin diseases, uh, pituitary problems. Um, I go to lameness. I have uh, pictures of uh, lame horses and, and how it works. I talk about very complex ideas such as vector analysis of lameness and uh, laws of physics. Uh, for those of you who really want to dig down deep and start a discussion there. Uh, horsemanship, of course, there's a whole section on that. Another one on behavior. Um, nutrition, horse husbandry, uh, all the different colors of the horse. I'm going to have uh, my age of horses, how you can take a look at teeth. Um, of horses from three years old to 30 years old, approximately 10 horses per age group, and realize that you can't tell the age of a horse by their teeth, but at least there'll be proof there. There's all sorts of stuff. It's Over the next couple of months, it's going to expand and reorganize. It's just going to be really cool, a great one-stop place to get trusted information. Okay, hopefully most of you have uh, run back to your computer screens, and we're going to move on to law number six, know the personalities of horses. Now, I know I'm at uh, 7.40 right now, and I don't have enough time in the next 20 minutes to cover everything. So there's a lot of reading to go here, um, and I'm going to try and go fast, uh, but I want to leave you with some really key points, especially about the six basic needs and how these laws interconnect with that. So Hippocrates is way back uh, near uh, before uh, B.C., and uh, he discovered there were four basic personalities. And since then, everyone's taken that and had their uh, derivations of that, like uh, uh, what do they call it, introvert and extrovert and all that other stuff. But I'll tell you what. If you want to become a leader, you have to learn how to listen. And, and you can't create a conversation unless you know who you're talking to. So let me go over these four basic groups. The first is sanguine. They're the life of the party, loves attention, loves the spotlight, fun to be around, makes friends easily, energetic, emotional, loves people, and they are charming. These horses love to have fun. However, their idea of fun may be different from yours, such as some people like to bungee jump and other people would rather die. But anyway, that's sanguines for you. They always also overreact to things. They're emotional roller coasters. They will focus on you intently, and then in a moment they'll focus on something else, and their, short, their attention span is very short. Uh, they might be considered or joked as having ADD, uh, but these... Um, 
these are human disease and, 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 and have uncertain causes. These horses actually may be um, reacting to some of the food that you're feeding them. And that's something I need to talk about over in um, chapter uh, 10, which is a horse is a horse. Feeding a horse correctly. I can't tell you how many horses I see that are very difficult to work with because they're in chronic uh, pain in their hindgut. Um, and any of you who know me know that I don't think grain should be fed to horses because I can't tell you the number of horses that have taken the two-week no-grain challenge and stopped feeding grain to horses, and within three to five days, they have a brand-new, low-keyed, focus-energied horse that they didn't know they had. It's that uh, demonstrable in some horses. If you go to theequinepractice.com forward slash grain, let me see if I can do that. The equine practice.com forward slash grain. Um, there, I just posted it. I think I posted it. There we go. Um, that would help. Um, you can also go to thehorsesadvocate.com forward slash grain. And that will also take the same, same spot. Uh, but I'm trying to get as many people uh, to try not putting horses on grain, and that really will help a sanguine horse to focus. Um, equal parts of certainty and variety work well on these horses. Um, a lot of um, horses don't really need to be that certain. In fact, uh, some horses that you bring in certainty in the stall feel like they're being challenged, especially when you're trying to develop your uh, levels of certainty. But with a sanguine, they like a, a person who knows what they're doing. Significance in terms of number of spotlights shining on them also works well. Keeping praise on these horses is really important. They love the spotlight. They love to know how good they're doing. They, they, if they, if they, are uh, punished for any reason. They they sulk. They don't like you know being told that they're not doing well. Uh, connection, growth, and contribution is less important. Just go into these stalls with certainty and give them enough significance, and these horses will do anything for you. All right, <clears throat> let's see. I discuss about sugar in their diet, um, and let's see. Good. Yeah, this whole uh, slide is about sugar in the diet and how it can affect all these personalities. Uh, just like gluten can affect a, a person with a celiac disease that is gluten intolerant, uh, some horses can take corn in their diet, even corn syrup that's in uh, red salt licks, and that's the only corn syrup they get, can get some diarrhea and some other um, interesting uh, things such as non-sweating, uh, girthiness, doesn't like uh, the girth being tightened, doesn't like to be brushed doesn't like to be fussed with, is grumpy all the time. Some of these horses are going to turn around on a dime if you take them off grain. That's for another story. In fact, I've done a whole webinar on it, so you need to go there or go to my website, theequinepractice.com forward slash grain. All right, the second personality is choleric. They're demanding, dominant, strong-willed, independent, confident, goal-oriented, good under pressure, and loves competition. They're usually very dominant. Uh, and, and stallions are often confused with this dominant personality, but they're not. You can have mares with canines. You can have other horses that are not stallions be very um, dominant over you. Uh, but cleric horses are not always good leaders. They think they are, but they're not. So you, and you have to keep in mind with uh, cleric horses that you have to establish communications and as soon as you do, they will communicate with you. It's not you communicating with them. They're desperately trying to communicate with you, and they're quick to dismiss you as being another stupid person. And with that comes the uh, clash of, of two uh, stubborn people, and that's where a lot of problems occur. And we get a lot of cleric horses uh, rescued off of, of the kill trucks and brought to us for uh, floating teeth. And it's so funny because these horses are so proud of who they are um, and then when they find that somebody's willing to communicate with, with them, they almost uh, just um, relax and totally give to us. They barely move as we get the work done in the horse's mouth. They are absolutely uh, wonderful to work with, these cleric horses, as long as you're uh, very clear and very certain of who you are. So if you have any fear or any lack of leadership skills or just plain unfair, they will dismiss you promptly. You, you will have lost a chance to be a leader with a horse, uh, and they'll run roughshod over you. But if you're confident, and most importantly, fair with your leadership abilities, then a cleric horse will become your best and faithful friend. I cannot tell you how many times Melissa and I will work on some of these horses, 
and the owners are absolutely blown away. They said, we had bets that you were going to die today by this horse. And the horse is just standing there with his head down, forehead in our chest as we rub their cheeks as they are so grateful that we set up a, a good communication with these horses. And what I'm teaching you tonight in this book, The Irrefutable Laws of Horsemanship, will teach you how to do this too. Give me a second. got to take a little sip here. Okay. Um, certainty, significance, and connection are your friends with these horses. Nagging or uncertainty is absolutely your enemy with these horses. Um, you just have to go in there and let them know that you're confident and you're certain, and that's enough of uncertainty. That's all they need, uh, and, and you'll have their attention. They'll say, huh, what? It's like walking up to the most famous movie star or uh, musical artist that you can possibly imagine, and instead of being nervous in their presence, they become nervous in your presence. They are aware of who you are. They know that you're significant, and they want to be part of you. And that's the feeling these horses have to have. They have to know the certainty that you're confident, that you're in there working with the horse, and that you're going to be fair with them. That's all they need to know, and they will do anything they want for you. It's such a cool feeling with cleric horses. Now, the melancholy horses, they're organized, orderly, thinkers, analytical, artists, perfectionists, need to be com needs to complete things, avoids attention. They're faithful, and they're compassionate. <coughs> now, cleric horses are really cool. And you can go to the other uh, webinar to get more information on cleric horses. But they have to have all their uh, ducks in a row, so to speak. So uh, you physically should talk to them. Uh, you can actually be over-talkative as long as it's very district descriptive. In other words, oftentimes with these horses, when we're, we're working on the right side, we actually say to these horses, okay, I'm going to move the, the float blade over to the left side now or to the other side. And the horse is like, oh, okay. You can almost see them say, I get it, because just because they can't speak English or your language doesn't mean they can't understand it. And that's such an important thing. It's just like, you know, people think mutes are, are dummies. They're not. They just can't speak, but they can hear and they can understand. And these horses are very, very intelligent this way. Now, you have to apply some discipline, and that means you have to break their state because they can become so focused on one thing that... It's, it's not on the agenda for today, but they are focused on one thing. And sometimes you just have to poke them in the chest and say, hey, with me? And they say, oh, yeah, okay, yep, sir, yep. So certainty and significance and a strong connection and a feeling of growth are important to these horses. They love certainty but they, and they love significance. They really like a strong connection. They love communication. And from that, they get a feeling of growth. They feel empowered by you, and these horses will do anything for you as long as you don't throw in some sort of variety. Like, oh, we're going out here, and hey, let's turn right instead of left. They're going to say, now, hold on. We always turn left here. Why are we turning right? You know, stuff like that. You have to understand with a melancholy top horse, you have to let them know it's going to be happening. Okay, the phlegmatic, which is the last one. These are low-keyed, easygoing, doesn't get flustered, takes his time, peaceful, everyone likes them, balanced without, but hides emotions. Okay, they're also called bomb-proof horses, and therein lies the problem because they're not bomb-proof. They just look bomb-proof. They're willing to do almost anything that you want, and they're just going to take it rather than complain. Now, here's the problem with that. Um, well, you can read this later. Let me go on to the next one because we're running out of time. Uh, they need reassurance when a stranger appears or something changes, but the unknowing person falsely reassures them by raising the energy and saying lies. In other words, they see something going on, the person gets nervous. Like my wife was riding a horse once, and a 10-foot alligator crossed in front of them on the road. Now, I know it's 10 foot because the road is 10 feet wide, and its nose touched one end of the road as it left, and its tail came out of the woods onto the road. It's a 10-foot long alligator, and that alligator came across, and it was up to the rider to have certainty that this alligator had nothing to do with them, and all they had to do was sit there, wait till it passed, so they could go on. It wasn't an attack alligator, and the rider knew it, and everything was fine, until one rider started to start blabbing away and, and raise their energy, and that started to get all the horses nervous. That's what I mean. Horses will follow the leader, and as long as you're the leader, the horses will follow you through anything. Okay, so while no one basic need is required to work with these horses, they will fail epically if they are not fed enough of any of the basic needs. It just doesn't need to be much, 
but ignoring any of these will eventually break the spirit and prevent any good relationship with a phlegmatic horse. So, just a little bit. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, sorry. There's a losing focus. Is this you guys or me? I don't know. Uh, I don't know what focus means. Um, hmm. But is it good now? Can anybody tell me? Can you see everything? You can see the words? Okay. Yeah, we're uh, over at the uh, saloon way over in Jensen Beach, about a half hour from our home because they have really good internet connection here. And all we have to do is eat pretzels and some of us drink beer. And, um, and uh, they give us the internet for free. It's pretty high speed here. So uh, if you're getting good, Abby says it's better now. Hopefully you guys are, are hearing this. Okay. All right, so that's about phlegmatic horses. Give them something always and try and give them something of each. Let them know that they're significant, even if the horse completely ignores you, which phlegmatics do. They never acknowledge that you're saying to them, good job. They just sit there like, yeah, I know. But they need it. Trust me, they need it. Otherwise, they will shut down over time. Okay, the one thing to know about personalities is um, most horses are blended blend of four with one that's being dominant. And here I have a couple of examples in here, um, and I don't really have enough time to go over that. So, um, okay, great. I, we're getting a couple of people saying it's, it's working. Oh, um, yeah, anybody have any questions on Law 6 or anything else? Because I want to get on to Law 7, and we only have eight more minutes to do the rest of this, which is, I guess I'm going a little over. All right. This is one of those things that you just have to listen to over and over and over again. I just do it every day, so it becomes like beyond second nature for me. Um, but it's huge. Once you learn these little basic things, uh, almost every horse, unless they absolutely shut down, and then it just takes patience. This is my wife explained to me the other day. If you're patient long enough, don't raise your energy and stay consistent with what your message is, your clarity, uncertainty, the horse will eventually give up and say, you know what, this is ridiculous. What do you want to do? And then they'll go ahead and do it. Okay. Law 7 is seek first to understand. Listening is the first part of communication, and there's no difference in, in between not knowing the language and not listening. Um, so when, if you stop listening to a horse, is when they become an inanimate object and no different than a car parked in your uh, garage. So uh, to listen, all you have to do is stop talking. Robert Williams, in his movie called RV, had a great line that I use all the time. He held his hand up to a couple of guys he was talking to, and he says, talk to the hand. Now, we've all heard this a million times, talk to the hand. But he went one step further. He said, talk to the hand, call waiting. I love that line because that means you're acknowledging the person that they have a story, and that person, and even your horse, has a story to tell you. But you do not have to listen to everyone's story, including your horse's story, because you're the leader, and only one leader can effectively lead. And if the horse is trying to lead by expressing his past, then he's not seeing the future as you see it. So leadership can never occur. So if your horse is trying to tell you his story, I hate vets, I hate men, uh, this is a bad day, I don't like this, you know, where's my food, blah, blah, blah. He's telling you his story, put your hand up, say talk to the hand, call waiting, let's start over. We're in the now. We're talking about what's happening today. Okay. Remember that if you're reflecting to your horse something that has happened in your past or in his past, that's exactly where you're leading the horse. So if you don't start with listening, communication will never occur, and your message, no matter how clear it is, won't be heard. So you must, you must listen and just don't accept what you hear. All right. So seek first to understand, but if it's the same old story, just put your hand up and say stop. I'm not interested in your story today. This is what I'm interested in. Do I have your attention now? And that's really cool. Um, use variety. Break their state. And, and some people, um, what I love to do is I walk in there, put the halter on and the lead rope, and then I turn around. And I completely ignore the horse. And I'm getting my stuff out of the bucket. I'm talking to the owner, and the horse is like, what the heck? I thought you just came in for me. You hooked up to me, and now you're ignoring me? Hey, hello. And they start sniffing my back there, and the whole energy comes down as they become curious. Now I have their attention. 
Now they're not telling me their story that I've heard that they've told a million times to the owner. Now they're saying, wait a minute, who are you? They've gone from telling stories to asking questions. And people and horses, um, they can't become frustrating, frustrated if you're not listening to the story. Uh, if it's them, I, I wrote this wrong, but I, what I'm trying to say is if they stop telling their story and they start asking the questions brought on by the uncertainty of what you're doing, then nobody becomes frustrated. They're more on the curiosity level, which is a much more empowering and growth-building emotion to be with, which is kind of cool. You should try it sometime. Just walk in there and then just don't do what you normally do. Don't reach in your pocket and give it a treat. Don't rub its neck. Don't say, hi, baby, how you doing? Who Mama loves you, all that. Don't do any of that. Just hook up, ignore, and do something. Rearrange the buckets on the wall. Do something different. And watch the horse look at you and say, what the heck? Who are you? And they've already gone from, here's my story, to... What are you doing? And once they start asking questions, you can get in there and start um, listening to what, um, uh, start telling what you want to do. All right, um, let's move on to chapter eight here, which is then to be understood. It's a continuation of seek first to understand, then to be understood. And these have to be done in order because if you go in there and say, hey, you know, I'm here to do this to you, the horse is going to say, over my dead body, and you already have an argument going on. All right, and if you go in there and say, I'm here to give you a treat, then they say, yeah, I expect that. Give it to me. Now I'm not going to do anything else you want because you haven't established any communication. But if you go in there and say, hey, how are you feeling today? What's your story? And they start saying, my story is great. I'm so excited for that you're here. What are we doing today? Well, this is what we're going to do today. That's really good conversation. But most of the time you walk in the stall and you say, hi, what's your story? And they say, well, my story is, oh, my God, I didn't sleep well. And they're, you know, coyotes howling last night. And, you know, I don't like the food here. And the neighbor next door is doing this and bang, bang, bang. And I have the TV on. They're telling me about all these problems in the world, blah, blah, blah. And the weather's lousy. Talk to the hand. Call waiting. Because that doesn't help anybody grow. It doesn't help the communication. And that's so important. Because once you seek to understand and then you break their state, and then you go over to the asking questions mode, then they can start to understand what you want. And now you have a completely good open channel of communication. And with each different personality, you're going to do it a little bit differently. Like for the sanguine, just go in there and you start making crazy faces and, and funny noises. And they're going to say, oh, wow, what's this? You do that to a, a very choleric horse, a stallion, you do that, they're going to turn around and kick your butt right out of there. You have to go in there and say, how are you doing today? A very serious type person. Uh, a melancholy horse, you go in there and you say, tell me what, what's on your list, what's on your agenda today. And the horse will say, my agenda is blah, 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 blah. And then you say, okay, now that I'm looking at your list, this is what we have to do. It sounds a little esoteric, but it's really true. These things have to be done with melancholies. And they will do whatever as long as you give them the instruction sheet. And the phlegmatics, again, just go in there and say, hey, good to see you. I hope you're having a great day. Hey, this is what we're going to do today. And they're going to say, okay, fine. Okay, all leaders will have an abundance of their own basic needs, and it is here that you contribute to the lives by giving your excess. That's what happens. Certainty works the best with all horses. If you go in there with confidence, certainty, and clarity of what you're going to be doing, horses will pay attention to you. Uncertainty or variety will help a sanguine as long as you stay ahead of their thinking. You have to stay ahead, one step ahead of them. Uh, but don't use that on any other horse. Just keep it a very subtle thing so you get their attention. Once you have their attention, just stop the uncertainty. Significance, when used correctly, will help um, with every horse. Significance in uh, sanguines, plenty of spotlights. Yeah, you're doing great. Significance with others is acknowledge that they're significant. You're an amazing horse. Let's work together. Let's get this job done. And then once you get your connection and it's grown, you're growing a connection. That's the growth part. You nurture it. Being aware of this is important in your success as a leader. But <clears throat> be, be, be aware. Well, whatever that means. Anyway, uh, be aware. That's what I want to say. As they contribute back in ways that we call gratefulness. And gratefulness is such a cool thing because when a horse becomes grateful, they're basically contributing back to you everything that you've given them. And that's what Melissa and I look for every time we flow horses' teeth is their gratefulness. And when a horse shows gratefulness, uh, it's just amazing. Okay, um, these are some simple things of how to work with the four uh, types of horses. 
uh, which I'm going to skip over. It's the most important thing to remember in horsemanship and communication that it takes two to communicate. So you're going to have to set up your, own, your horse to be willing to communicate with you, and that just takes practice. Okay, any questions on this? All right, we've got Law 9 and 10 coming up. Um, and while these are really, really important, uh, these are something that we can all review later, but energy is everything. You've heard me say this a ton of times, and if you raise your energy, they will raise their energy too. It's like water. Water always seeks the lowest spot, and as you bring your energy down, everyone else around you will come down with you. Now, I am horrible at this at home. With my wife and son, and they're sitting here, they can agree. My energy, wham, you push my button, my energy goes straight up. And your horse is going to push your button too, bam. What did you do that for? Bam, your energy goes back up. You have to learn to recognize that and bring it down. Because once somebody, once a horse challenges your authority, and every horse always challenges your authority, so does your spouse, so do your kids, so do your parents, they always challenge your authority, you need to bring your energy down because then it's going to eliminate any of these challenges. Now, let me go back to this. Um, what happens if there's a horse challenges your authority? Okay, result one, you surrender your leadership role to the horse and he becomes the boss. He eats all day, you go in the house either wondering why you're wasting your money or worse, you're in an ambulance. Okay, so we don't want result one. Result two, no one surrenders the leadership. The horse raises his energy and you raise your energy to match. Then you up your energy level and the horse does the same. This is what we call a crescendo. It means the, word, the music grows louder. And whenever a horse starts a crescendo, it's so important to stop that crescendo. And there are on occasion some horses that automatically go into this crescendo mode. And the only way to stop them is to give them medication. And yes, that does happen. Not every horse is perfect. Not every human is perfect. We have felons in our society, and there are felons in horses. And so not every horse is going to be perfect. But with practice, you can get 90% of the horses you see to respond to you. And that's what we're working on. So the result number three, when your, your leadership is challenged, if you remain the leader, it will come from the lowest form of energy, from confidence, from contributing your abundance in your life to those around you. Then as a leader, you cannot raise your energy to the level of the horse. It's just impossible <clears throat> to raise your energy and contribute your abundance at the same time. It doesn't happen. The only time that happens is somebody puts a gun to your head and you contribute the money out of your wallet. But that's not what we're talking about here. When your horse starts screaming, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the leader does not look at the sky. He does not crescendo. The leader only sees where the leader wants to be and leads the followers to that place. It's that simple. All right, <clears throat> when your energy does rise, you're reacting. No one ever contributes their abundance. Okay, um, but we've been trained because we see all the dramas on TV. And, um, and then the problem is most people don't want to become leaders. They want the benefits of being a leader, but they really don't want to lead. They've never been taught how to lead. They don't know anything about leadership. And so a lot of conflicts arise, and they fall to their training, which is the TVs, the drama series, and they say the things that they hear on TV, and they escalate in their attempt to become significant in the conversation. And they do that by tearing other people down and name-calling. It's so common. We see this in the po political process we're having now. One political candidate will call the other person a name. And it, as simple as you're a liar. And next thing you know, they're trying to become significant by tearing somebody else down. That's not how we do leadership. Leaders begin with the end of the mind and are unaffected by current events. Achieving the desired results by empowering those around them is the focus of a leader and reacting to negative things blocks this from happening. That is really important to understand. <clears throat> the, um, Okay, that's, that's nine, and uh, I'm so sorry I'm having to rush through this. I promise you guys one hour, and uh, this has taken a little bit more time than, I, than I'd hoped. Uh, but Law 10 is so important to understand, and it's easily applied no matter what your personality is. Yet in my experience, this simple thought seems so elusive because people live in a complex world. People have become confused between the emotion they have, being with horses, and the fact that it is the connection with a horse that brings the joy and not the physical horse. In other words, nobody really likes to muck stalls in sub-zero temperatures, but we do it anyway. And the reason why we do that is not the cold toes. It's, it's the connection we have 
that we're working with a horse, but we're not the horse's slave. And this, the horse is not our slave. These guys need to become willing partners. And as soon as you get them to that willing partner stage, oh my gosh, you have no idea how good this, this can become. In fact, Melissa and I have a joke. Every morning that we get out there on the road and we're going to the first call and either something's happened at home or some sort of news is affecting our ability to stay positive or, or upbeat or we're just plain grumpy because we didn't sleep well or we didn't sleep at all. We say to each other, don't worry, wait till that first horse is done. And after we're done with our first horse, and it doesn't take the second or third horse, it's always after the first horse, we walk out of that stall with smiles on our faces because we made a connection, we helped contribute to another horse, we gave more than what we had, we saw the growth, the connection occur, and the horse gave back to us in gratefulness. And then the horse owner gives back to us saying, wow, that was amazing, and then they write us a check. And so we walk out of there saying, wow, we got to do what we're teaching you right now tonight to do. We do this every day, and it's so much fun to see it happen. So anyway, just remember, your horse is not a surrogate child, a surrogate spouse, therapy for your problems at work, the friend you can't find in the people in the world, not a cow, not a dog, a cat, or any other animal. The horse is an individual living being with certain means and desires unique to that horse. So are the people around you. So are the cows, dogs, cats, and any other animal around you. They're all living beings with certain needs, wants, and desires. But with the horse, what makes them so unique is they are so in tune to who we are and what we're doing that you can actually build up a huge communication with almost every horse. I try it with the cats. They just don't do it for me. But with a horse, I'm telling you what. When I walk in a stall, I'm very clear of the horse. I'm a human, and he is a horse. And I open up the dialogue. I start the communication, and, and we respect each other because respect is everything. And it's always given to those who give it first. But respect is not submission. It is only con contributing the abundance of certainty, variety, and significance to create a connection that grows a relationship. I talked to a guy in Tennessee who's thinking about taking our school, and he actually trains horses using quote-unquote natural horsemanship. And he started talking about getting the horses to submit and do what you want. And I said, you know, that's not going to fly here. That's not what we do. We don't ask the horse to submit, just like we don't ask the, the spouse or the child or, the, or anything else to submit. We encourage them to become a willing partner because we're asking them to do something that will empower both of us. It will make our lives better, richer. It provides growth. And that's what leadership does. So that's what's really cool. Uh, I've been told that the only one I can change is me. I think this is the basis for Law 10. A horse is nothing but a horse, and for us to turn him into something else is disrespectful to the horse, just like if I called you a female dog, and you know what word that is. That would make you feel so uncomfortable and disrespectful. Well, by calling a horse anything but a horse is, I think, just as disrespectful. They don't want to be your little doll and to, to dress up and prance around. They're there to be respected, and you can find out exactly what makes them um, feel good. And you can only do that through uh, uh, setting up a great communication process. Okay, and remember, feed them like a horse, please. Feed them hay, grass, pardon me, grass, then hay, uh, water and salt. And then if you have to add energy, consider a medium chain triglyceride, which is a um, monounsaturated fat, which is non-inflammatory, avoid, avoid the polyunsaturated fats, including corn oils and all the other vegetable oils that are out there. Um, uh, coconut meal is a great source of the medium chain triglyceride fat. Uh, I always recommend cool stance. They don't pay me anything, uh, but I recommend them everywhere. And be sure to feed your horse plenty of protein because it's the protein that's required to build the muscles, the tendons, the skin, the immune system, and every cell in a horse's body. And I feel like most horses are chronically being underfed. If you want more information about feeding a horse, go to thehorsesadvocate.com forward slash grain, and you'll see all my articles on that. And do me a favor, stop calling your horse stupid, killer, and the like, uh, and stop assuming if they are a certain color or breed, they'll behave in a certain way, i.e. all thoroughbreds are crazy. These are all stories inside of you and preventing you from becoming a great horseman. All right, so there's 10 laws. Um, they're there to help you develop two-way communication. Stop rewarding bad behavior. Start working on yourself and treat all horses with respect by sharing your abundance. Okay, one more shameless... Uh, request for you to consider getting the 10-year irre irrefutable laws of horsemanship. And once this uh, 
webinar webcast gets uh, mounted on the website. It'll be there for eternity for all of you guys to listen to. Again, I go very fast. I've been warned to slow things down, but as it is, I've already taken an hour and ten minutes of your time, and I uh, apologize greatly for that. Hopefully, most of you stuck through this. Um, it's what Melissa and I use every day. Uh, you can go to the Horses Advocate, become a member, and you'll get this book for free. Read it and learn it, and then ask me questions. Ah, oh, man. If any of you fell asleep during this, I swear to goodness, I'm, I, I want to know what it is <laughs> that you're doing that gets you so tired. This, here, you know, I've been doing this for 43 years. Since 1973, I, I, I started working with horses full-time professionally and then went on to vet school and became a veterinarian and been working with horses ever since. And here it is, 8 o'clock at night on a Sunday night where everyone else is out partying. You know, there's a whole bunch of you that signed up to, to listen to this thing and I am pumped. I'm absolutely juiced. And um, I don't know, I guess I'm crazy because um, in about a few days, seven days or so, six days, I'm going to get on a plane. I'm going to New York. I'm going to work there for two days. From there, I'm flying to New Orleans. I'm going all over the great state of Louisiana, coming back through the panhandle of Florida, working my way through to Tallahassee down to Gainesville, down into uh, Orlando. I'm going to get on a plane there. I'm going to fly all the way to um, Seattle, Washington. I've got a whole bunch of people out there who really appreciate this horsemanship style dentistry that we do. Uh, we go... Um, uh, we virtually go anywhere in the United States for uh, 10 or more horses. So if you've got 10 horses or more, you just call up and we'll uh, commit a, a, a trip to your area to get those horses done. Um, hey, Michelle, thanks Michael. to you too. Oh, Michael, sorry. My eyes are so blurred right now. Uh, but thank you, Michael, for stopping by and listening. Um, but we go all over the country because the horsemanship that I've demonstrated, I've discussed with you now, is essentially what we do every day and we practice it and it does work. It works everywhere and people want this and that's why they're calling and willing to ship me out all over the world. Oh, Terry says I get to see you next week. This is so funny. I have no idea where I'm going other than I know generally where I'm going, but uh, I'm, I can't wait to see you. I really can't. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Charmaine, breathing is important too. You have no idea. When students come here, and um, they start learning how to float horses using our technique at the Horsemanship Dentistry School. Hint, hint, horsemanshipdentistryschool.com. If you want to know more about our school and teaching this, a whole section of that is on horsemanship. And when the students come and take their practical down here in Florida with us, um, we, we use the word breathe so many times. Breathe, breathe. And I've used another word in this that you might, guys might have uh, heard because it sounded unusual. But I skipped over it. I didn't spend a lot of time. But it's the word intimate. When you want to become a leader, you have to become intimate with those that are leading. And a lot of the students who come here, they keep the horse away at arm's distance. Um, at arm's distance, you can't build a good relationship. You have to get close, bend your body, and become one with a horse. And I find that those people who become more intimate with a horse, they become flexible and move with the horse, they usually do a lot better with horses because the horse doesn't feel like he's being braced and challenged. Uh, but breathing is so important. Okay. Um, <laughs> I have everyone at my human dentist office sold on your methods. You know, I'm telling you, this works with humans as well. You have no idea. You should try it sometime. Memorize this stuff and go out and practice by going into a local convenience store and walking up to the person behind the counter and try to pronounce their name. And usually it's a, it's a name from a different country, so I have difficulty with that. But if it's as simple as Bob or Mary, I say, hey, Bob, how are you doing? They immediately snap their eyes up. And I'm like, fine, how are you? It's like such a variety, such a um, something that they weren't expecting that I got their attention. I said, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Man, it looks busy here today. Or, geez, it doesn't look like anybody's here. What's going on? They all, like, conversation starts. And next thing you know, we walk out of there, and I know I've made that person's day, and he, that person's made my day, and it didn't cost me anything. It didn't cost me anything. Oftentimes, they'll give me something for free, and I'm not even in there looking for something. They say, oh, yeah, keep the change. Don't worry about it. i got plenty. Just these little things. It's really cool. 
Thanks, Charmaine. I appreciate it. Uh, we all do. Um, be sure, everybody, if you like what we talk about, to uh, tell everybody about it. Make them, uh, you know, not make them. Ask them. Lead them uh, to our YouTube channel. Lead them to the Horses Advocate. Uh, lead them to uh, the Horsemanship Dentistry School. Lead them to HorsemanshipDentistry.com to learn more about Horsemanship Dentistry. Or call us up for an appointment by going to EquinePractice.com. We'll take anything, including smoke signals. We'll answer you by text, by phone message, by email. Just um, go ahead and, and um, figure us out. Yep, there we are, youtube.com forward slash user forward slash horsevet, H-O-R-Z-V-E-T. I set up this thing back in 2007 before YouTube was even like really recognized as a big thing. I've been on there like forever. And Matt is in charge of all the new content. And he's going to do a phenomenal job of adding all these uh, videos that we're going to be producing this week and the next week. Okay, is there anybody else who has anything else to say or forever hold your peace? Abby, you have a good night too. I appreciate that. Okay, y'all. Good night here from uh, the Horse Advocate, and I appreciate your attendance. And don't forget, the first Sunday of every month, we have a webinar, and the next webinar, I believe, is on the pituitary and pituitary adenomas and how it can cause Cushing's, uh, which uh, is a hot button for me. So that should be a really good one. All right, so uh, the first Sunday in, in uh, August, I'll be here, 7 p.m., and I'll see you then. Thanks, guys. Good night.